February 2023, I had one of those reading experiences that reminded me of my childhood bookworm days, when I'd get so immersed in a novel that I'd take it everywhere and talk about it with everyone. The book was True Biz, a novel about a residential school for the deaf, where the lives of three characters with diverse experiences with deaf culture converge. Before starting the book, I had a minimal understanding of sign language, but a deep curiosity about experiences of deafness. My partner has moderately severe hearing loss in one of his ears, and I have a young family member who had just gotten a cochlear implant. When I finished the novel, I realized just how much more I had to learn, specifically about the distinction between deaf with a lowercase d and deaf with an uppercase one. Deafness as a physical condition of hearing loss, and deafness as a cultural identity. This is Embodied, our show tackling sex, relationships, and your health. I'm Anita Rao. Folks who identify as deaf with a capital D often use and prefer sign language. It's a mode of communication that's likely been around in some form for the entirety of human history, but was more formally recorded in the 17th century. Despite a popular myth, there is not one universal sign language, but hundreds of sign languages that have emerged throughout history when deaf people have come together in community. Someone who is a fierce champion of sign language and deaf culture is Sarah Novich, the author behind the book I was telling you about earlier, True Biz. Sarah is also an instructor of deaf studies and creative writing and the author of the novel Girl at War. We're also joined today by Joshua Seckel, who will be interpreting for Sarah in this conversation. And we're recording a video version of the show, which will be available at our show page, embodywunc.org, where you can also find a full transcript of this conversation. Sarah, welcome to Embodied. Thanks, Thanks, Anita. Thanks Thanks for for having having me. me. So an estimated half million people in the U.S. use American Sign Language or ASL as their preferred means of communication. Can you tell us a bit more about the particular origin story of ASL? Well, I think that we are still trying to fully understand how ASL developed. We're learning more about it. But basically, the idea, there's a gentleman by the name of Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet. And what happened is he went to Europe looking for a way to educate deaf children here in America. Because America at that point had no deaf schools and no deaf education. And most people, if they had enough money, they would send their deaf children over to Europe to be educated. They lived here in America. So he decided he wanted a way to educate deaf children here in our country. He went to various places in Europe and saw different methods to educate deaf children. And he happened upon a guy in France by the name of Laurent Claire. This is his sign name. Laurent was a deaf educator. He was deaf himself in France. And they used... French Sign Language to communicate and to educate the deaf children. Gallaudet convinced Claire to join him on the voyage back to America and together over the um, ship ride, they exposed one another to their languages. They got here to America and they established not the first deaf school because there were already some smaller programs that people had established for small circles, but it was the first school that was recognized as the American School for the Deaf. From there, they had deaf children from a variety of backgrounds that enrolled. Some of them used home signs mixed with French sign language, and it also had a mixture with Martha's Vineyard sign language, which was a language that developed on Martha's Vineyard because there were many deaf people that lived on that island at the time. And all these these different different signing signing modalities came together together. here at the American School for the Deaf. And the students interacted, and that was the formulation of the beginning of what we call American Sign Language today. 
So yeah, that really rich history and the formalization of the, the coming together in 1817 when Thomas Gallaudet established that school in Hartford, Connecticut. And he was a really strong proponent for American sign um, and really wanted that to be a foundational part of the education of deaf children. But there was some pushback to his educational approach in the latter half of the 19th century, in large part from someone who many of us first learn about as the inventor of the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell. Um, but there's a lot more to Alexander Graham Bell's story. Can you tell us more about him and how and why he became such a strong opponent of a sign-based education? Well, Alexander Graham Bell is a complicated figure. Many people assume that his involvement with the deaf community was because his mom and spouse were also deaf. So people kind of trusted his opinion and ideas about deafness at the time. His goal, his latent goal, was that he preferred oral education. And that wasn't necessarily best practice but that was his goal. He wanted all American children to be speaking spoken English, and he wanted public schools in America at large to just use spoken English as the primary focus. And that would be arrived at through speech therapy. Many people assumed that it would be best for deaf children at the time, but actually it turned into something completely different. What were some of the ramifications of his approach on deaf students in schools in that period? What did it look like to go to school? Those deaf students would still attend schools for the deaf, but in the schools themselves, they were compelled to use spoken language. Some of the students were punished physically if they did try to sign to communicate. They were hit, they had their hands shut in drawers, and there were other punishments. They would have to wear mittens so that they could not communicate manually in sign language. But in the dorms, the kids still passed on sign language to one another. And that is really how ASL survived through that dark period. For the longest time, ASL was banned at schools for the deaf, basically. It was a difficult time, and it created language deprivation for many of those children. Deaf people who were former teachers at those schools for the deaf were eliminated. They were kicked out of the schools, and that created a cycle of language deprivation on unemployment for many deaf people at the time. So there was an evolution of the thinking around deaf education. We've marked a couple of important moments in that history. Starting in the 1960s, um, there was kind of a, a recentering of ASL and education through the publication of a book of a linguistic scholar that more formally recognized it as a complete language. This is a big question, but how would you describe how the state of ASL education has evolved in the past 50 or so years? <laughs> well, that's a really loaded question. I agree. In some ways, we do see more and more recognition of American Sign Language as a bona fide language. In the past, most people didn't really understand that ASL was a language. They thought it was universal or people didn't understand that it was a separate language from English. But ASL can function completely. Um, sometimes more, it can function more than in English. And at Schools for the Deaf today, we typically do see the use of a bilingual approach to education where the children learn both American Sign Language and English. But the problem arises is that it's very hard for these families to send their students to schools for the deaf because the school districts would prefer to mainstream them. 
and use that approach. Um, they think it's not expensive. And the idea that we should just include them in an inclusive environment, deaf children with hearing peers. And schools for the deaf we're seeing are shrinking in numbers because of these decisions by the district and the educational attorneys and their approach to deaf education is still very problematic. I want to pivot a little bit to talk about your own personal experience of learning and, and being immersed in deaf culture. Your own hearing loss started um, in your tween years. You failed your first hearing test when you were 12. Tell me the story of that day and, and what was going on in your mind about your hearing loss at that time. It's funny you asked, because I was just writing about this very thing. And I was thinking about that day and what I recall. And how I didn't fully realize exactly what was happening. I first thought it was a little strange, but I didn't notice these sounds. But then also, how do you know you miss something if you miss it, right? But then the thing I remember most from that experience at that time is feeling scared. I was also a huge nerd. So when tell me, somebody says I failed a test, it got me really upset. That never happened in the past. <laughs> but really, I didn't quite understand the deaf community. I didn't interact with other deaf people and I felt very solitary. I remained in the mainstream setting and I tried to hide and disappear. Mm. And I thought of myself as broken. I wasn't a hearing person. And later, I started to meet other deaf people. And I started to learn American Sign Language. And I realized that it wasn't broken. I was just different. And so that was a big deal, obviously. A huge mindset change for me to learn through a different language. And I needed language to access education to the world around me and to form my identity and to better understand myself as well. We talked earlier about that difference between little d deaf and big d deaf. Can you talk about that distinction for you and the role that learning and becoming fluent in ASL played in your immersion into deaf culture. Yeah, I, it's been interesting. I mean, now in the deaf community, we talk a lot about that separation between little d and capital D deaf and whether that's really necessary. We've had a lot of discourse around that. And I think that when we're trying to explain a different experience. And many deaf people do not have a choice necessarily to learn ASL or not. Their family, their parents, their doctors oftentimes make those choices for them. And so I didn't wanna use that separation because of that, that, that division to explain somebody's experience for them or to judge anyone. But I can say that most definitely, I needed ASL in my life to better understand myself. And I needed other deaf people in my life to also understand myself. And I think that's a common experience, not just for deaf people, but for any marginalized group. I've been talking with author, educator, and advocate, Sarah Novich. She'll be back with us later in the show. But first, I'll meet an ASL poet who is also the executive director of a nonprofit that showcases ASL through performance and storytelling. You're listening to Embodied from North Carolina Public Radio, a broadcast service of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. You can also listen to Embodied as a podcast. Follow and subscribe on your platform of choice. We're going to be right back after this break. Tobacco is story. I'm Anita Rao. Storytelling is an integral part of deaf culture. There are many myths and tales that have been passed down from generation to generation. Like one about a planet called Ayat, 
where everyone uses visual language regardless of hearing ability. For decades, deaf artists have adapted those stories for the stage in the form of ASL poetry. Poets express nuance visually using emotion, rhyme, and rhythm to convey meaning with each movement of their body. Douglas Ridloff first saw an ASL poet perform when he was a young man, and he was inspired to start composing his own works. Fast forward to today, and Douglas has become an ASL poet known around the world. He's also a performance artist. He's also a performance artist, filmmaker, ASL master, and the executive director of ASL Slam. We're also joined today by Flip Wilson, who will be interpreting for Douglas in this conversation. Douglas, welcome to Embodied. Yeah, hi. Thank you for having me here. And a note, we are recording a video version of the show, which will be available on our show page, embodywunc.org. You can also find a full transcript of this conversation. So Douglas, we've been talking with Sarah about the history of ASL and the threads of oralism. You went to a deaf school growing up, but it was one with an oral philosophy. What did that mean for how you learned and how you were exposed to ASL? Yeah, I grew up attending the Lexington School for the Deaf, which is a deaf school, as you say. All the uh, students are deaf who are in attendance there, and the teachers were not permitted to sign. Starting at kindergarten through almost all of middle school, I believe, uh, as I recall. So we had to speak and use oralism. We had to attend speech therapy three times a week. Everything was focused on speech and your ability to talk. There was no instruction in American Sign Language. And in the classroom, we had to speak with the teachers if we wanted to communicate, all of that. But then fortunately, we as students would sign with each other to communicate in our off time. So when we weren't in class, we would uh, that's how we would chat and talk to each other. And fortunately, there were people who had sign language at home and brought it to the school and spread it. Right. So I'm really a self taught signer in a way, but I did learn it. It wasn't like a, a quote home sign system. I learned official ASL through my peers. And I would say I was language deprived. That was one of the impacts. My mother tongue was taken from me. And I struggled with writing in English, uh, but that was a tool for me to communicate. Um, but I didn't get foundational initial access to American Sign Language until I started to learn it in school. And that set that foundation for me and allowed me to thrive as I went forward. But yes, the school experience, very focused on the oral methodology. <clears throat> Times have changed. Now the teachers do sign at Lexington. And from middle school through high school, all the teachers signed with us. And we had deaf teachers as well as our educators. And so I was able to pick up a lot more fluency throughout those years. And so it was that. in some of those later years, I think you were 16 in high school. Um, the first time you experienced ASL poetry, there was a well-known ASL poet who came to your school. Can you take us back to that moment and what you remember from that day and the effect that uh, poetry exposure had on you. Yes. Yeah, I had never known that ASL was more than just a language to communicate, to chat, right? I had never visualized it being utilized for anything else until Peter Cook, who was the poet who came, came and performed and showed us his sign language poetry. And my mind was blown. <laughs> I was like, wow. I was just sucked into it. It was so immersive. And I said, that's what that looks like. You know, I, I found it incredibly inspiring. And immediately I jumped into that world. And um, as a flower, I just blossomed and bloomed. So, yeah, there you go. You slowly started experimenting with your own poetry as a teen, but it wasn't until you were in your late 20s that you first got on stage what did it take for you to feel ready to perform? Mm. Well, first I was uh, 
playing with it almost like it was uh sports we do sort of like visual uh, about sports rather that was the interpreter's mistake there about baseball or basketball we'd show those sort of sporting events happening through sign language and it would use it to describe volumes and describe things in a more visually experimental way and then college i sort of stopped playing with language in that way i would say until near sometime near the end of my fourth year at college when it started to come back to me i started to play with sign language again and experiment and we had a small group where we would assign with each other in visual asl and then i went back home after i graduated from college and i recall one day i was with a friend named Jason Norman, who asked me to come out and do some signing. Uh, we had gone to grad school together and he had seen me sign, right? And uh, I I wasn't just, uh, I was a little shy at first, right? Initially, I had only signed with these little groups. I mm -hmm. didn't have the bravery to just burst out on stage. Um, but we had been playing nightly and as we knew each other in grad school. And so then he brought me to ASL Slam to get me up on stage. He kept dragging me onto stage and calling me every <laughs> month at ASL Slam to come up. You know, at first it was like baby steps that came up once and then another time. And each time I got on there, he had me longer and on the stage for longer and longer periods of time until that became my home. And then I was on the stage the whole time. So yeah, that really developed my confidence for me working with an audience. And you know, that was the beginning that took me to where I am now. And I love being on stage now. So there's no one-to-one -one translation between ASL signs and English words. There are some signs that are straightforward nouns, but facial expression, body movement, speed, and hand shape are all part of the grammatical structure of the language. How do you like to describe the differences in structure of ASL to English speakers? Sure thing. Well, hmm. they're totally different. Let's start with that. <laughs> At the same time, they both have their own foundational rules, right? English has its list of rules, and some of those you could apply as examples to ASL. Let's say there's rhythm, rhyme. Of course, they are sound based in English, right? So if the sound sounds the same and also alliteration is another version of that where it's the a bunch of words start with the same sound that's alliteration there are similar things that you could do in american sign language poetry so you could base it on hand shape for example or orientation there are five parameters uh including the non-manual markers that you would be the facial movements but let's say for example in English, if you started with uh, the sound of S, and you're going to repeat the sound of S as alliteration for a bunch of S sounds in a poem or in writing, you could do that in American Sign Language, let's say, as an example, with the three hand shape. So this three hand shape could be used a bunch of different ways. You know, I could return to it as a rhyme, or I'll show you here is a car that's bouncing on a road. It transforms into a person running. That person jumps. They transform into a bird or a butterfly flying. That turns into a person running and then turns back into a car driving. So with one hand shape, we can show that. There's the car. There's the person walking. You see their footsteps are the tips of the fingers. And then you see the butterfly with the wings flapping, but all with the, the hand shape of three. And not hand shape isn't just the only way that you could do it. Uh, for example, movements as well could be used. You could repeat certain types of movements. So let's say I have the S hand shape, but I'm using it to swing a bat or some other object. And then you could repeat that sort of swinging motion in a poem and also orientations of my, I could sign a whole poem with my poem oriented upward to give it its own effect. So I guess I'll leave that at that. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great, that's a great explanation. Uh, we'll also share some videos of your poetry online so folks can can watch it and have more context for what we're talking about. But I want to talk more about ASL Slam, which you mentioned, a, a place that was foundational to your own exposure um, and development of your artistry. 
you are the executive director of ASL Slam. It's a nonprofit that hosts open slam events for artists and performers. And you've said before that one of the goals of ASL Slam is to show the world that ASL is not just used for communication. Can you talk a bit more about how the diversity of ASL is explored through these slams? Well, the goal is really to have this place where deaf people and signers, signers could come and play with their language. Uh, a lot of people and the deaf community don't have the opportunity or the place to do that. To socialize, you know, or a place to look up to new role models, just as I looked up and saw Peter Cook when I was 16 years old. And so that initial experience as I thought about it started me thinking about other deaf people. So that stage is a place to plant the seeds of the next generation into that audience for people to come and to see something. And also where we can bring in other artists and performers, poets, storytellers, musicians, rappers, whatever it is, any form of performance in American Sign Language can be brought to that stage so that people can see it and maybe when they're at home start playing with their own language and creating their own content. <clears throat> you know, I've got these two deaf sons of mine, these boys, and uh, that caused me to invest in SLAM more and to want it to expand more because I would think of them and I know that they have friends who need that exposure, right? They need ASL to be more than just a modality of regular daily communication. And we need that whole message to spread. I've been talking with Douglas Ridloff, a visual vernacular artist in the form of poetry, performing, and filmmaking. He's also an ASL master and the executive director of ASL SLAM. And I'd like to bring Sarah Novich back into the conversation. Sarah is an advocate and instructor of deaf studies and creative writing and the author of two novels, True Biz and Girl at War. Joshua Steckel is interpreting for Sarah in this conversation. So Sarah, um, Douglas was talking about the experience of being a parent. And I know that that is also something, um, part of your, an important part of your identity. And I want to talk a little bit about um, some of your, how some of your thinking around parenting and some of your thinking about deaf culture have kind of come together. One of your sons is hearing, the other is adopted and deaf. How do you think about the transmission of deaf culture within your family unit? Well, it's quite interesting to see both of my sons and how they're developing. I have a hearing son who his first language is still ASL. He's a coda, right? But then my deaf son, he was adopted at the age of four. And so he experienced language deprivation. It was very stark. But now his ASL is really taking off and we can see this happening. But it's been interesting to see how the mind works and the way that minds change when you have access to language as opposed to not. And now ASL is a huge part of our family and the way that we communicate together. I think CODAs or children of deaf adults are quite interesting. And they're an interesting part of the community because they're in that liminal space between where their first language is ASL, but at the same time, if they walk out the door, then the whole world out there is hearing and they're seen as hearing and they understand everything that's happening. And so they're, they navigate between both worlds. But it's been a valuable experience. And I think it shows the hearing world something different, that value of ASL to everybody. 
Douglas, you uh, explore some of this delicate balance in your art. You have a poem called Symbiosis. It's about the symbiotic nature of bees and flowers, and it's a metaphor for the deaf community. Can you talk more about that delicate balance that you're exploring in that piece? Yeah, that poem, Symbiosis, is a symbol. It's a metaphor, right? We have the flower on the one hand and the bee on the other. And uh, the bee depends upon the flower and the flower depends upon the bee. And without each other, neither one can survive. I got the perfect moment of fireworks here from my uh, emojis <laughs> in my in my Mac. <laughs> No conflict there. All right. So, um, yeah, so we apply that metaphor to the deaf community and to, you know, ASL, sign language. Without American Sign Language, you have to ask yourself what would happen to the deaf community. We see language deprivation, we see isolation, and we know that over time that community would disappear, would go extinct. And if there was no deaf community, would sign language thrive and continue? Would it exist? I don't think so. And that shows that symbiotic relationship between the two of them, just like the bee and the flower. And uh, also specifically, you know, I want to say like, don't take our language. Don't take the language around, away from deaf people. That is my language. Who are you to take our language from us? I want to talk with you both about being artists who sit at the intersection of um, creating for multiple audiences, creating for audiences who primarily use ASL, creating for audiences who primarily use English. Um, Sarah, you really navigated that tension in the process of writing your book, True Biz. What were some of the, the biggest obstacles for you in creating a book that spoke to and connected with both audiences? Well, for me, that was a big obsession of mine when I was writing the book, because when I started, I decided that I wanted to write this book about deaf people. And that was it. I don't want to have to do any explanation. I didn't want to be preaching at all. <laughs> and then I wrote the book and I handed it off to my editor. And the editor is a very smart, mm -hmm. capable person who knows me. And um, she's a hearing person, right? And so she gave it back to me with a lot of different questions, just basic questions about the deaf community and American Sign Language. It was a whole litany of questions. And at first, I felt a little frustrated about it. I'm thinking, why do I need to explain myself? And then I later realized that if I wanted hearing people to read the book and really connect with the characters and have empathy, empathy for the deaf experience that they needed background. They needed that information. They needed some historical context to understand our experience and that that was okay. That was challenging for me to accept personally because I felt like it wasn't fair. And other writers don't necessarily have to do that. But there was a big challenge for me to try to depict ASL on the written page. And obviously American Sign Language is a three-dimensional language and you can't just put it on a flat 2D surface. But I wanted to really emphasize to hearing people that American Sign Language is not broken English. That in many ways for deaf people, ASL is far and above what English can do and how to show that on the paper that was experimenting. And there was a huge challenge in the terms of writing that into the book. Douglas, you prefer to not have your work translated into English, but there is one poem um, or a series of poems that you wrote kind of with the intention of building a bridge toward uh, a primarily English speaking audience, those literary journals and publications that really emphasize the importance of written text. So I wanna play a clip of you performing um, two poems for a poetry reading at the Harvard Radcliffe 
Institute and then talk with you about them. The body of work is referred to as the Heart Series. The first poem is titled First Glance Romance, and the second is Heart of Glass. Let's listen. First glance, love dub, love dub, a chance, love dub, love dub, romance, love dub, let's dance, love dub, love dub, love dub, forever. Ah, at last, I may open up to share this heart with you. It, slam! Um, I sweep up these shattered shards and ball them like burger meat and put this raw heart back where it goes. Those are two poems by Douglas Ridloff interpreted in that clip by Flip Wilson. Douglas is with me today and Flip is also interpreting for him in this conversation. So could you talk about those poems and how you walk that line between having an art form that you don't want translated most of the time and wanting to build a bridge to a hearing audience? Yeah, well, first of all, I'd rather just leave the poem there as an example of my self-expression, let it stand on its own. I wouldn't want anything to take away from the original poem, the core of that. And, you know, different people might, in absorbing that or taking it in, interpret it in different ways. They might not get it word for word, but they might find their own way to sync with it. Right. And then, but if people read the English, uh, you know, there might not be a satisfactory way to do it. So, but I had to decide that I was willing to build that bridge to meet that audience to sort of bring their understanding closer to the ASL poem and ASL poetry. And there are different ways uh, that we can do that. You can have the English version, you can have the musical version, you can have the version of it that is images. And with Heart Series specifically, uh, we also had art some art series that we did we experimented with different ways to reach out to the audience to do this thing to build this bridge some were more successful some were less successful but uh, uh had did it also with graffiti on the wall where i would po perform a poem based or connected with that graffiti so that there's an image behind me and i'm doing that poem and a hearing person watching it could identify the image and maybe track the sign and also i there's a lot of ways that you can translate poetry, right? Uh, it's hard to go word for word. There are things that could be interpreted a lot of different ways. There might be three or four different words that might equal a single sign in a specific context. And also the use of space, and the spatial uh, use is nonlinear, uh, whereas English as it's written is a linear language. So it's a lot, it's challenging. I'd love to end talking with you both about um, this WHO report that was published in March 2021 that predicted that unless some specific measures are enacted related to increased healthcare and mitigating noise pollution, one in four people will have some degree of hearing loss by 2050. And Sarah, I'd like to start with you. Given that and given what we know about current understandings and conceptions of deafness, what would you like to see change in the conversation around deafness and around ASL as we look to that future? Okay, um, listen to deaf people, right? Um, it sounds simple, but I think Today, there's so much focus on trying to fix deaf people. Hmm. And so much energy is expended in that effort. And then, for example, there, if, you, if you have an event that you're hosting, hmm. 
And then later you think about it and think about how to make it accessible. So you have to go back to the drawing board and add in different accommodations after the fact. But if you had thought about making the event accessible from the get-go, it's much easier. It's more fluid. And it might be less expensive. And so encouraging people to really start thinking from the deaf perspective and interact with deaf people to better understand our lens and then integrate that into the process instead of trying to force it on us later or try to compel something that's not going to work. Douglas, I'd love to pose that same question to you. Yeah, the best way to get through to hearing people who have no idea about the deaf world or uh, people who do know something about the deaf world, but for one reason or another are oddest or um, have an oppressive view in some way, let's say the best way to show is through art, not by preaching at them or being didactic, by storytelling. Holiday movie, I mean, Hollywood movies, poetry, storytelling, various types of art forms, forms of showing the deaf experience and deaf culture through art. That's the way that we can reach out to that hearing audience to get them to be willing to listen and to watch. And I think that's the best place, that's the best chance we have of penetrating into that audience and changing their perspectives. Yeah, I believe that's the best way to do that. I've been talking with Douglas Ridloff, who's a visual vernacular artist in the form of poetry, performance, and filmmaking. He's also an ASL master and the executive director of ASL SLAM, and Sarah Novich. Sarah is an advocate and instructor of deaf studies and creative writing and the author of the two novels, True Biz and Girl at War. Joshua Steckel and Flip Wilson have also been with us interpreting in this conversation. Thank you all so much. Thanks so Thank much you. for having us. Just ahead, we are going to explore the rich history of one ASL dialect, Black ASL, which was developed by students in segregated deaf schools. And we're going to meet two scholars who are studying how BASL signs have evolved over time. Stay with us after the break on Embodied. <laughs> 